Oh, hey, Sharpie. Hey. You know what time it is? Time to hang out with our internet friends. Time to hang out with our internet friends. It's Taylor Primetime. We're live on the internet. Hey, Andy, take it away. You guys got friends? We got, well, we got a couple <laughs> of friends. They hang out with us every week. Cool. What time is it? What time is it? It's prime time. It's prime time. What time is it? What time is it? It's prime time. It's prime time. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, all around the virtual world. Yeah. It's Tuesday. And Tuesday in Southern California means it's prime time. Say hello to Mr. Chris Sharp. You can call him, you can call him, you can call him Sharpie. His favorite day of the week is now Tuesday. Back again for his third appearance on primetime. Something three or four, 34. Please welcome Mr. Andy Powers. Hey yo! Hey yo! And your host, Mr. J. Parkin on Prime Time. Oh. Yeah. It's the best. Hi, yeah! Jack. It's so good. Nice one, it's so good. It's like, I mean, that's I the best. Long game. time on that one. What's that? I worked a long time on that one. Could you tell? Uh, yeah, 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 you did. Absolutely. Yeah. I watched you write it. I, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Taylor Primetime. It's our favorite day of the week, Tuesday at 6 p.m. All of our friends are already here. I know. They're all here. They're all hanging out. They're saying hi. Are. Hey, Paul Tobias. Paul Tobias is here. Hey, hey Paul. What's up, Paul? You know, Lun, I got to say, as great as that intro song is, I still like the one that you wrote about the duck riding the bicycle better. <laughs> that is a really, really good song. The lonely. That's a really good song. Mallard, yeah, the Lonely Mallard, Mallard Ballad, Am yeah. uh, inspired by Amsterdam. Yeah. Go figure. The Lonely Mallard Ballad. That's great. I, ca I can't wait to hear that. Welcome back, Andy Powers. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Andy Powers. Welcome back. You know, we said that we were on, you were on here for the third time. It's actually the third time, right? Because the first time we tried to go live with you on Taylor Primetime, we broke the internet. Don't know if you guys remember that, but we didn't show up one night. Well, that was Andy's fault because, you know, the popularity made the internet just break and you couldn't get, couldn't go live. And that happened anyway. Either, either that or I, either that or I forgot to charge my phone up. <laughs> it could have been. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. We forgot to charge YouTube. I think that was the deal. Something like that. Anyway, uh, so we're back. Taylor Primetime. If for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, this is the Guitar Nerd Talk Show where we go live every Tuesday evening in California and we nerd out about guitars. You know what's awesome is my mom watches the show every week and uh, she says every week I get a text afterwards that says, I don't understand most of the stuff you're talking about, but it's really interesting. So, <laughs> yeah. And your mom also told me to upgrade my, my system. So new spot, I got faster internet this weekend and a new desk. So hopefully everyone can hear me today, but thanks Jay's mom. If you're watching already wow. for uh, yelling at me about not hearing me. <laughs> yeah. Nice. My mom fixed it. It was great. Awesome. Well, Andy powers. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank welcome you. Back. We tonight, the subject is, and before we get into the subject, we got a couple of segments we need to go through, but the subject is picks and strings, guitar picks and guitar strings. That's it. Awesome. You, you guys have wanted to talk about this for a long time, so we're answering your request. Picks and strings, and who better to talk about picks and strings? Mr. Andy Powers. But before, before this, if you joined us last week, you know we have a new segment on the show called Hug Your Haters. Uh... Andy, you got a song for us? I do, Jay. All right, take it away, Andy. Everybody needs a hug these days. Maybe more now than ever. Remember to keep your hugs distant and virtual. 
Stay safe. Don't take hate, babe. And hug your haters. Hug your haters. Hug your haters from at least six to ten feet away. That's my that's my favorite part. <laughs> I, we well, all thanks agree. for coming to the show tonight we can't top that you know? we, all, we all agree with you andy lund's songs are the greatest part of the show and along with our guests but man your music is great andy thank you again for another wonderful song here so hug your haters is a segment where we touch on a maybe frustrated email we've received or some sort of communication about the show and we would love you to know that this week we got zero hate mail for the show. That means everyone loves it. Let's give it a digital high five. It's more of a celebration. Woo! All right, we did it. We did it. No hate mail this week. That's great. You guys are back with us. We're going to kick it and we're going to get right into the subjects. Uh, no, that just means we're going to get only hate mail next week. Yeah, totally. But that's fine. <laughs> we need to feed the segment. Hug your haters. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and your, your emails go directly into my inbox. So, so go ahead. Fire them away. I love it. I love it. It keeps Chris busy. All right. All right. So picks and strings. Let's dive right into it. So how this show this week is going to work, it's going to be awesome. All right. We are going to chat about picks and strings for a few minutes, and then we're going to bring a rapid fire Q&A with Andy Powers. I hope all of you have your questions ready. We got 17 pages of questions or something like that via email, and we're ready to... An Andy, are you ready for the task? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. I love it. It, no, the look. I've spent my entire life being around guitar players and guitar makers. These are my people. <laughs> I can, I, I can be as. I, I, it's wonderful to get to talk to people who have interest levels and enthusiasm for what I love in. It's amazing. I love it. So bring it on. I'm ready. Man. You are pretty inspiring. We got to hang out with you earlier today. And well, Andy Lund and I did in a private, locked, closed door session, maybe or maybe not looking at a top secret guitar. Anyway, that happens at Taylor. I don't know anything about it. So it, it, that was fun. Thanks for that, Andy. That was a good time. Anytime. <laughs> was actually, that was the best part of my day. Actually, that was cool. Unexpected. Well, I'm th thank you. I'm honored. Yeah, that was cool. It was, oh, okay. Enough of us. We're talking too much. Let's get into the subject. Yeah. Okay. So we want to talk about strings. We want to talk about picks and we want to talk about strings. Let's go into strings first. Often, okay. Andy, um, we are asked the question why we use certain strings on certain guitars. So maybe if you give us a little insight um, on why different string gauges? Why we set up guitars certain ways with certain strings? Why nylon strings are used on nylon string guitars? So on and so forth. If you want to give us okay. some, time, we would appreciate it. Okay. So think of it this way. Lots of, lots of people have cars, right? I mean, I have a car and lots of people drive them. Every one of those cars has tires on it. Okay but not every car uses the same tires. Now there's a lot of things that'll drive that. Some cars need big tires. Some of them need big knobby tires if you're gonna drive through mud or snow. Some tires are made from really hard, hard rubber that are meant to just roll easily so you get really good mileage. Some tires are real wide and skinny. Some tires, are meant for cars that are, you're gonna drive really fast. All of those different things have different reasons for a different tire, right? It's kind of the same way for guitars. Okay, there's, there's different styles of guitar that you're gonna use and a different style of playing. And so the, the way that strings developed, we started specializing certain alloys, certain compositions of string, certain construction style, in order to manipulate those different characteristics to give one design, one size of guitar, or even one playing 
style, a little more effective usage. And so it sounds kind of funny to describe it, but it's, it's largely the same thing. The strings that you're going to use depend on the guitar that you're putting it on. That's, that's good information. Um, we get asked all the time on the socials for sure. Um, why in particular do we lean into elixir strings um, from the factory on most of our guitars? Well, it really is because of the coating that they put on them. Okay, so a little bit of, a little bit of uh, practical stuff. Let's say that we build a guitar and we set the guitar up in our factory. You know, um, I don't know if many people have seen it. I go by there several times a day, but we have rows of benches and really good folks who are setting these guitars up. You know, they get everything adjusted right, they te play test them. And then we're gonna put that guitar into a case. The case goes into a, like a vacuum sealed bag. The whole thing goes into a shipping box. But by the time it's in a box, man, nobody, we can't actually know whether that one guitar, unless it was a special piece we built for one particular player, we don't know if that's gonna go to you know, the music store down the street from the factory. We don't know if it's gonna go across the country, if it's gonna go into a shipping container, onto a truck, onto a boat, onto another truck, into a warehouse, onto another plane or another truck, finally to make it <laughs> to some music shop, literally halfway or more around the world. So you don't really know whether that thing is gonna get played, opened up and played next week or in like six months, or you put the guitar onto the wall of your favorite music shop. And how many different players pick that thing up and go to play it before you got to try it? Well, I'm, maybe everybody's washing their hands nowadays, so maybe a guitar strings will last a lot longer. But in, you know, in the kind of the pre-COVID world, you'd have a bunch of sticky fingers all over that guitar before you ever got to try it. You can be relatively well assured that that set of strings is going to be so far gone by the time somebody first picks up the guitar, you don't actually get to hear the real, like the true color of that instrument. So when Elixir started coded, doing their Teflon coated string, that was a real win for a guitar maker because you could put this set of strings on ship the guitar halfway around the world or down the street. And that set of strings is gonna sound pretty fresh because all the space between the windings on the, the wound strings are all sealed in. It's, it's like this thing's got a little kind of protective coating over it. They last and sound for, fresh for quite a long time. So that's the real reason that we use them. They're, they're good strings, they work really well, but most importantly, they last really well on a brand new guitar. That's awesome. Andy, you're traveling all over the world. Andy Power or Andy Lund, you're traveling all over the world, usually, right? When we're not in a quarantine scenario. Um, but I mean, it, can you attest to this? I mean, you see these guitars that are in every, I mean, your climate, yeah, your Asian market, the climates are all over the place. I mean, can you attest to this as well? Yeah, I, I can attest to that. And even being a, a guitar store owner in the past, when I had lots of sticky fingered customers <laughs> come into the store. Um, yeah, even if it doesn't need to ship around the world, that happens, guitar strings yeah. don't last that long. And, and I think that most people who are gigging like electric guitar players, if you got a Friday and a Saturday night gig, it's not uncommon that you would put on a new set of strings for each gig, because they don't last that long, right? And- Oh, totally, I used to do that all the time. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it, they, they, it does last. The thing that you see with elixirs, they last so long is that people, the, the, the coating starts to wear out and they actually get worn down. Yeah. The, string, the string becomes compromised yeah. because it's been hit so many times by your pick, but it still sounds pretty similar to the way it did when it. Yeah, yeah. It starts to look like the little pilly fur balls that you get on a sweater that's been worn a lot. Yeah. You know, you get that kind of frayed thing where your pick is hitting it. Hey. Um, 
we, we've touched on the pandemic a couple of times now in, in conversation. There's a, there's a question that came through from Tex um, along those lines, thinking about if, if you're playing, if you're playing out and around in public, or if someone else is playing your guitar, um, how, how do you recommend cleaning those guitars to, to kill if there was virus that got on it without hurting the finish? Like, well, Ooh. like what, what do you do? That's a, that's actually a really good question. Yeah. That's a very good question because it depends on exactly what finish that guitar has all over its wood. Yeah. Because you, there are some chemicals that you can use that'll work okay. And the finishes that we mostly use, I say mostly because not all of our guitars are wearing the same finish, mm -hmm. but let's say on an El Cajon guitar, it would be pretty easy to use not wet, but a little bit of rubbing alcohol on a, like a clean paper towel or a clean cloth and kind of wipe that down. That's not gonna hurt anything, okay? But if you try to do that on an older version that has either a really thin varnish finish or a older nitrocellulose lacquer for finish or something like that, no, yeah, you don't wanna do that. You're gonna, you're gonna cause some real, real bad stuff to happen. So it's kind of a tricky thing, but yeah. clean, wiping it off, cleaning it off is pretty good. Just so, a little bit of rubbing alcohol goes a long way, huh? Yeah, yeah. Some guitar polishes apparently do a pretty good job or at least they don't feel so sticky afterwards. So it makes you feel like it's a better idea. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've seen, I know I've seen some people use um, like a tiny, tiny bit of, of like ham soap. And I haven't seen anything go wrong with that so far, but I haven't seen that done on many guitars. So I, I would be, I'd hesitate to recommend that. I'd, I'd probably be the guy who accidentally squeezed half the bottle of soap okay. on there. So I, I don't know if I would do that one, but. Nah, it's my kids. <laughs> we'll get back to strings for a second. So yeah. um, back to some of the questions we get. So we, we see all sorts of stuff, right? And often it's from people who haven't been playing that long. I mean, we got some seasoned pros over here in, in the live feed who are, are, are probably like, yeah, come on, you can do that or you can do this. But it, there are people who just don't, they're unsure. Is, is it okay to use another brand of strings on a Taylor guitar. Well, of course, of course. I mean, you buy it going back to the tire analogy. Let's say you buy a car, you use that first set of tires and then you just got to pick out something that's appropriate. Maybe you put on Michelin's, maybe you put on BF Goodrich or whatever. Yeah, it's a kind of a personal choice. They all have a little different characteristic. They'll have different handling characteristics or anything like that. Guitar strings are just like that. So we use the Elixir Phosphor Bronze strings. We love them. They work really well. They last a long time. It's a nice kind of what I describe as a middle of the road sounding guitar string. You know, it's not too bright. It's not too dark. It has a pretty even uniform sound. So that works really good. But every string maker has their own unique twist on it. I mean, no pun intended, but the exact way that the lower wound strings are wrapped, the exact alloy, the way that the metal, that wire is drawn, the exact hardness level of that alloy, whether the core is round or hexagonal shaped, any one of those variables will change from one brand to the next. You know, everybody's kind of got their secret sauce, their recipe, right? Now the, the trick and kind of the beauty is that you want player to pick the strings that work best for their playing style, their guitar, maybe the pick that they're using, if they're using one, the environment that they're using the guitar in, the role that they're using that guitar in, all of those things, there's a lot of latitude to make different choices when it comes to strings and picks. So like for my own guitars, man, I, there's not even a one set that I could say, this is my favorite set of strings because they all have something different and I want to get a different characteristic out of every one of those guitars. 
So for certain guitars, I'll use the Elixir Foster Bronze strings, maybe a light gauge or an HD light set. Other guitars, I'll use a medium set. Some guitars, I really like Daddario's Nickel Bronze set. That's a really unique flavor for certain sounds. Uh, some guitars, obviously a, a nickel plated or nickel wound electric guitar string set is more appropriate. Some guitars, flat wound strings are appropriate if you want to have that like, kind of the smooth polished feel for certain sounds, maybe half rounds. Like I have a, a older hollow body bass that I use a lot when I'm recording. And I, for that bass, there's something about the GHS half round string that is like, it's magic on that one bass. Mm -hmm. So every one of those instruments has a unique feel based on what, how you set it up, what strings you're putting on it and the role that it's expected to play. Yeah, that's so absolutely. It's totally okay for people to experiment. In fact, I, that's something I encourage because we put the, the Elixir strings on there and they were great. A lot of people find that that is the best string for them. And other people find that, man, they really love Daddario strings. They really love Ernie Balls or they really love, you know, the clear tone or what Tomastic or any of the, the string makers that all have a real unique thing that they're doing. Yeah. Andy Lund, you raised your hand. I know you have something to say. I have a couple things to say. The the string that I really like that doesn't get much attention is silk and steel strings, Andy. You know? Yeah. Those are really yeah. stunning hybrid of guitar strings. I I love it. That's mm. something that I wish more players even knew they existed. Because it's it feels like such an old fashioned like composite set of strings. Mm. I mean there's only a handful of folks who still make them, but that is something that's, it's pretty unique sound, pretty unique feel. It's actually a string that I really like on a GS Mini. Mm. You have to, it's, the tension profile is pretty different, but it works pretty well on a GS Mini. At some point in the future, I'd love to be building a guitar specifically for a string set like that, because it is such a unique feel. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that you say flat wound and you say nickel, nickel bronze, because we've had these discussions where um, on particularly the Grand Pacific 517, so Builder's Edition 517, the Diodario nickel bronze is my string of choice for that. Mm -hmm. But well, I a bunch of my bluegrass friends are into that. But I recently heard a set of flat wounds, just a Diodario flat wound set, on a 717 and it blew my mind so i mean <laughs> i mean the hey, that's, that's kind of an odd mix but man there are certain things like that they they just work i i mean it's weird it's weird so yeah. the point of strings here is i i think uh I, maybe before we head over into the pick territory um do it try some strings yeah. try some different yeah. things um there's some questions over here and there's now, some one one comment on that okay you when you start altering tensions yeah you do want to pay attention to what you're doing because there are certain things that are a bad idea you could do some damage like you don't want to take a nylon string guitar like let's say you have an 812 nylon string or the academy nylon string that andy lunds play in there don't go putting a phosphor bronze set of strings on that guitar <laughs> that's going to go badly you don't want to do that. Why if, not? You're gauging, if you're gauging up a little bit and increasing the tension, you'll want to watch the way that that guitar responds because chances are you'll need to equalize some of the tension by a truss rod adjustment. You might look at a few different um, intonation aspects, uh, specifically the string compensation. If you depart ra radically from the way that uh, it was set up, You'll need to account for that. So you can always gauge down, that's always safe, but usually the guitar will play best and sound best if you can also do the other setup adjustments that go along with that. So a good place to start, let's say you've got uh, an 814, okay? 
That guitar right now is we're setting it up with a phosphor bronze 12 through 53 set of strings. You could easily try four, five, six different brands of acoustic guitar round wound strings that are approximately the same gauges, somewhere around 12 through usually 52 to 54 on the low E. You could try any of those strings without changing the setup at all. Because they're all gonna fall within at least a similar enough tension profile that they'll work just fine. But if you took that same 814 and decided, mm, actually, I want to try a larger medium gauge set, you're going to need to do a truss rod adjustment. You're gonna to wanna to check the setup. Sometimes in our case, because we're really, we're very persnickety about the ne exact neck angle that we like. Right. And our neck angle is really easy to change. We would even recommend a tech adjust the neck angle slightly for the way that the top wants to respond to that tension. So if you change brands, even change alloys, that won't change ra so radically that you need to reset the guitar. But if you start changing sizes and making a dramatic shift in tension, then you probably want to look at some of those adjustments. Hey, Jay, there's a question here from Will in the email that we got that actually takes Andy. It's it. I think Andy can expand on what he just said. And I have an idea about the answer, how I would answer this question. But I'd like to hear Andy's answer. He says, I recently changed factory strings from 12 to 11 gauge and okay. noticed a, a loss of proper intonation. Is okay. it necessary for a new setup or? OK. So let's say an 11 gauge, that's probably like a, what some makers, I think that Aro calls it a custom light. Yeah. Usually that'll be like an 11 through 50 or 11 through 52, something like that. Okay, so if we, the intonation changed, the first thing that I'd look at is how did the string height change? Okay, because that's probably got the same plain E and B with a wound G. That won't radically change your set point, mm -hmm. but if your truss rod adjustment is a little out or your string height changed, that will start to throw the string compensation off a little bit. So that's something that I would look at and, and probably adjust that. One of the no, other yeah. factors, My, one, sorry to cut you off, one last thing that I'd add about that is you're looking at a lower tension profile. If you were, pressing the strings to the frets just as hard as you were as on the 12 through 53 set, you're gonna stretch those things really sharp because right. you're actually bending the string behind the fret, bending it towards the wood of the fingerboard, which would radically throw off your string compensation. Okay, so a lot of times when you gauge down like that and you go to a much lower tension, you'll wanna look at the playing style of your fretting hand, because that can be a bigger influence than you might think. Right, because you can you can make things go sharp with pressure. I'm not talking about sharpie, but you can make things go sharp. Yeah, we're we're That's not the, talking about go left-handed. Also, <laughs> the energy from your your strumming hand, it, those strings can't take as much either, so they're going to go true. a little boingy. But and so the playing style has a lot to do with that too. I think. Yeah, yeah, it's actually. It's kind of, it sounds- He's pretty good. Um, this, guy's, this guy's pretty good. Like he knows the answers to a lot of these questions. Like Andy? Yeah, yeah Andy. He's, I know, Andy Powers knows like, it's so- no, Okay, well, well here's, here's a, a kind of a funny, a funny thing. This goes way back. I mean, I didn't know these guys personally. I'm not quite that old, but we have, everybody knows who Galileo is, right? Yeah. Right? Physicist, not astronomer, personally. mathematician. I mean, I'd never met him, you know. Right. His, da his dad was a lute player, okay? Pretty famous one at the time in kind of the broke Renaissance era thing. But he, they made some discoveries. One of the, his first important contributions was the discovery of the relationship between string tension and pitch. Now, it's not the big kind of aha moment is that it's not linear, right? It's actually the, it changes by the square root of the tension. So it's, Imagine it as being like that, 
And so when you have a, a very loose string and you make a small change in tension, the corresponding change in pitch is radical. It's very, very dramatic. If you have a string that's super tight to begin with and you make a little change in tension, eh, it doesn't change as much, okay? So what you see is when you have a really light, light gauge set of strings and you press down and make a small change in finger pressure or a small bend, man, it makes a radical difference in the pitch. So like uh, Andy Lund pointed out, if you're using a smaller set of strings and you really put some muscle behind your pick, you'll actually stretch the string from its nominal tuning point. You'll stretch it and it'll bounce so far sharp that you'll hear it throw the, uh, the initial attack off quite a bit. You guys are the best guitar nerds I know. This is awful. <laughs> I'm just sitting back in the back seat like a roller coaster, just listening to you guys chat. It's so good. But we have to segue into picks. Okay. Because that's part of the, the game here. So an inspiring thing that I once heard you say a long time ago, maybe, I don't know, I had been working for Taylor oh, a month or two, and we were mm -hmm. doing a video shoot, and you said that a guitar can't make a sound without the guitar player and the guitar player mm -hmm. can't make a good sound without the guitar. So it's the relationship yeah. between the two. So we, you know, part of that is in our tone equation that we've discussed mm -hmm. on the show a few times and a big one. Now we've got strings, you know, on the shelf for the evening. Now let's talk about picks. Okay. This is something that I've noticed you do all the time. You have a different, you, you gave us a demo on top secret guitar number 472 today. And I saw you in the middle of the demo c continuously pick up different picks. Why would you do that? Yeah. It, um, it, for those of us who are using a pick, I don't always use one, but when I do that, that, Thing, that little chip of material is like the connection point between this, the player and making a sound, right? It influences what you do with the string a huge amount, way more than we, honestly, way more than we even want to give it credit for. I mean, I can't tell you how many players pick up the guitar and go for the exact same medium pick that they've always used. And they might not know what material it's made of. They might not even know its flexing characteristics or, or the exact thickness. They just grab what they grab, right? Well, it, it comes down to damping. It's a, big, it's a big part of it. Because what a pick does, aside from setting the string in motion and deciding the type of motion it gets set into, it will determine what parts of that string's sound get filtered out. Okay, so quick little, uh, quick little lesson on it. When you strike a string, you get a note that you play. Let's say you hit the open E string on the, that low fat string on the guitar. Well, you get that E, but you also get a bunch of other notes that get kind of smashed together. So you get one, a note that's an octave above, you get a fifth above that, you get another octave, you get the third, you get all this stuff that we call an overtone series. Well, the higher you go, the smaller physically those waveforms get. Okay, so the big one is like, you know, it's like half of the guitar string. You get uh, half of the string, you get a quarter of the string, you get the third of the string, you get, anyway, this series that gets progressively smaller. Okay, so by the time you have a pick with a real wide, call it point, that might be as round as your thumb, you're actually dampening off a lot of the high end, what we call partials or overtones. So a pick that has a real wide profile, big round thing, we're going to hear that as dark, warm, bassy, full, depending on what adjectives you want to use. If you go the other direction and you want to hear a lot of that real high end harmonic series or overtones. Maybe you use a pick that has a little tiny sharp point. It takes up such a little space on the string and it rolls off so quick. 
every one of those high frequency partials will come through. You, you'll be able to hear them. So we end up hearing that as bright, clear, vibrant, articulate, you know, trebly, brash, depends on how you how you want to listen to it. And so for different different styles of playing and what you want to get out of it, a different pick shape is appropriate. The yeah. materials, the materials also matter. The the way the edge addresses of the pick addresses the string matters. So if you have like a real thin, let's say you have a really thin pick. As you go to strike the string, the pick will bend and flex out of the string's way because it's actually less strong than the string is. And so it won't be able to displace the string sideways very easily. And you'll hear that kind of thwack sound as the string sort of snaps by the string. For certain playing styles, that can work really good because it acts like a natural compressor. It lets all the strings be struck very, very, very homogeneously. If you want more dynamic range out of the guitar, you might go the other direction and use something really thick. Like some guys, especially the gypsy jazz players, some of those players, they'll use picks that are two, three, even four millimeters thick. I mean, like a big old giant thing that's super rigid because it gives them a huge amount of expression on the string. Yeah, I, I don't think I had my first experience with picks. Um, I was in the studio with a band, guitar teching a band in the studio, and the producer was particularly working on it they were we were recording bass parts and the producer came out and just like most producers have a mic microphone closet or they have an amp rack where they have all these amps or pedals this guy pulled out a big giant toolbox and evenly spaced the little compartments were picks for every different kind of, of thing and it yeah. was it was the first time I used a, I you know I actually used a felt pick for a bass and it was for that particular tone he was looking for so I've had I've had my eyes open to picks for a long time but yeah. we get that all the time mixing people um, I'll live mix people and and they wonder why their guitar sounds very kind of sandpapery sh 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 like and then I'll go look at their picks and it's about the thickness of a sticky note Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the 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 reason they use those when I ask, oh, it's interesting. Have you ever tried a thicker pick? And they say, well, no. It would be so much harder to strum that way. Um, do you have anything to say or to that one? That if one so yeah, yeah, actually, it's um, in some ways they're right, but only if they're using their entire hand to grab the pick, because you really, you need to have a little more dexterity and relax the picking hand a little more so that you can control how much attack you want on that pick. Like just while you were talking, I reached into my pocket to see what I had. <laughs> and I happen to have, uh, today I have three. So this one, that one looks like a Dunlop with logo wore off it. That one, little tiny guy, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got a sharp little point. That's an electric guitar pick for me. Some people play acoustic guitars with that, but it's tiny enough that I can hold it like that and then use these fingers in addition to this. I've got this one. This is a Dunlop prime tone. This one's one and a half millimeters. It's got some really neat beveled edges. That one works pretty good. The material is pretty neat, really thick by comparison. This one, I bet you most of the time I'd probably use the round corner because by the time I'm playing something like that, I actually want it to be really big and warm. This one was given to me by a friend a long time ago. That one's actual, that one's actual tortoise. Um, I'm not sure how old this thing is, but they, it kind of lasts forever. But I know I've had it at least 20 or 25 years. So. <laughs> That one works pretty good still. <laughs> you should empty your but, pockets. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, oh that God. one, that one, it's not something that um, that is encouraged because. Who's that one? Yeah. Man, that we 
there are so many good materials that there's no reason for this to still exist. But I've had it and I don't lose it, so I keep using it. That's Sometimes. Fantastic. So I guess the point here would be try different picks. Yeah. We have a lot of picks. We make tailor yeah. picks. You can try our picks. You can go into a store and just grab a grab bag of picks and just try them. Oh man, like some of the, uh, we're making these ones that have, it's a pretty low density material. It's not a real hard, like bright sounding material. It's, it's not soft, but it is kind of soft. Uh, we're calling it Thermex. It sounds amazing if you're looking for a darker, warmer sound. It works super good. If you want a classic celluloid sound, we're doing these, these Ivroid ones that are really cool. There's a bunch of good flavors and it's interesting to try out kind of like a, like a matrix of different thicknesses and different materials to see what that'll do on the exact same guitar with the exact same set of strings. Amazing. All right. I think it's come to that time. Andy, are you ready for some rapid fire ish question and answer? Sure. All right, let's do this. Nothing with me is ever rapid. No, you know, but we appreciate that. Andy Lund, do you have a song for us? Rapid fire. Rapid fire is not his thing. He digs guitar picks and strings. Well, things for sure, he ain't no liar. It's Andy Powers on rapid fire. Nice. <laughs> rapid fire. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so good. By the way, Andy yeah. Lund didn't know we were doing a rapid fire session tonight. So he wrote that song in the last 15 minutes. So good job, Andy. That was fantastic. All right, Sharpie. Let's dive into some Q&A. We got about 20 minutes. And uh, I'll let you take it away. Then yeah. we'll go to Mr. Lund, and then we'll go to me in the Padres hat. All right. Cool. At, at some point, we need to address it. Someone asked a question to Andy Lund. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we, we got 14 pages of, of stuff that came in via email, and this chat is blowing up right now. Um, I'm actually no going to go like complete. The Let's do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go completely away from strings and picks because this one was fun that came from Z. Simple finger picking with light strumming. What wood combo are you picking for Z's custom guitar? What size guitar? What size guitar, Z? Got to know what size guitar because that changes a lot of things. Let's see if he answers in the next five, five. seconds. Okay, while, while he uh, types in an answer, okay, the reason I asked that, when I go to, when I'm thinking about a custom guitar, I want to make big decisions first, small decisions later. A really big decision you want to make, how big is this guitar? Because if we're talking about a GO here, I mean, that's a big, big body. And because of that, even if I want to play it with a delicate touch or use it as a finger style instrument, yeah, I got to know that. So, Grand concert. Grand concert, 12 Grand fret. Grand concert. Grand concert, 12 fret. Ooh, good, co good call. You're a <laughs> finger style player. You're playing lightly, delicately with a pick. Man, you could use almost anything, but I'd recommend a top wood that's relatively soft. By soft, I mean soft as in toughness and density. So you want to look at something with cedar. You, wanna, you might consider redwood, which is a really cool choice. You might consider uh, Engelman or European spruce. The reason is those lightweight tops are set in motion really easily. So even though you're playing with a relatively delicate touch, the whole guitar is gonna light up with a really rich thick overtone response. So I would lean somewhere on that end of the scale. If you imagine a top wood going from, let's say we're just talking about the coniferous trees look from like sea, Western red cedar to Adirondack spruce on this end of a continuum, you want to live somewhere over here. So Adirondack spruce, really good, but it's going to take a long time for that thing to reach its full potential. If you're playing it really delicate, you want to start out somewhere over here. Andy Lund. 
It's a question from Simon Luder in England, which he has a PS at the end. It says, I played my Taylor guitar in a historic English Civil War castle, which I thought was cool enough to give him a shout out just because. That's it's awesome. <laughs> um, I'm jealous. He has a lot of questions. I picked out one that said, is there a relationship between the type of saddle, which I think he means material, and the pickups? And is bone the best? Okay, good question. There is a huge relationship between a crystal-based or a piezo pickup and the saddle. Because what's happening is that pickup is listening so close to the saddle. They're actually touching each other, right? Okay, so imagine that pickup has a field of vision that isn't a big, wide, broad thing. It's like looking at that saddle through a drinking straw, right? It's got blinders on, it's this tiny little spot. So you're looking for a saddle material that is as consistent in density and consistent in flexing characteristics as you possibly could use, okay? That means that most natural materials are out of the question because they're inherently not uniform. So something like bone, it can sound pretty good as a saddle, but when you put a piezo crystal pickup next to it, all you hear is that one little spot that the crystal is touching. And as you go from string to string to string, you might have six or in our case, three radically different sounds, which makes for an inherently unbalanced pickup sound. So we use a, like a military spec grade of linen-based micarta that works really well. It's ultra consistent in its composition and density. So that's the, that's the true reason that we use that is it just works better. It's a more consistent, more uniform material. Awesome. I got a question over here from the live feed. Uh, it's, it's, it made a statement beforehand that said beginner question. And I wouldn't say this is a beginner question because a lot of seasoned guitar players don't know. Andy, how do you know when it, you need to change your strings? <laughs> That's yeah. actually a really good question. Yeah. Because, I had that on my list. Because, you know, there really isn't a right and wrong answer. That's why I laugh, because you'll find all sorts of guidelines. Some people will say, if you're using a set of elixir strings and it looks like a frayed sweater over back over the sound hole where you're strumming on it, it's time to change them. Fine, that's a pretty good guideline. Some people will change their strings after every gig because maybe if you're an electric guitar player and you're bending on them and working that thing over, that set of strings is dead by the end of the night. I've had other players go years on a set of strings because they specifically like the sound of a worn out set of strings. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's not an easy question to answer definitively because the I guess the right answer is when the strings don't sound good anymore. Like when they're not working well, there's a couple of physical things that wear out. If they're not holding tune well, if the intonation starts to get poor, so they don't play in tune well, or if they feel kind of worn out, sometimes you'll start to feel little bumps in the windings where the fret has kind of distorted the shape of the string. Those are all good indications that it's, it's time. Also, past, if, your fingertips, if your fingertips are green, when you get done, <laughs> it's time to change. Yeah, Gross. yeah that, was, that was probably a little too, too far. Sharpie, your turn. <laughs> yep. Oh, uh, you know what? About 10 of these came through via email, but we're just going to ask it once. What do you think about blue chip picks? I like them. I like them a lot, actually. They, um, they tend to wear really well. I like the smoothness that the edge retains. Some picks, some materials, as they get used, they start to abrade and they get a real, like a gritty sort of feeling where you need to go polish them back up. Other materials like the blue chip picks tend to wear pretty smooth. So it has a really clean glide off the string. They're not great for every playing style and they're certainly not great if you're the type of person who loses them. <laughs> I talked about that in the thing, yeah. right? Oh, and Andy, I think I you're mean, up, right? Really, some, some picks are a little more expensive than others because the effort you put into making it 
And so those blue chips aren't ones that you want to accidentally lose in the, the washing or dryer or something like that. No. That's what I talked about in the feed. It's like, find your, uh, find your picks in the dryer most of the time, right? <laughs> yeah. Got to check the lint trap. Andy Lund. So I, I have a question that I think Andy Powers can answer in rapid fire uh, way, no, rapid fire kind of way. This person, this is from Craig Hindley, who says, "I've just purchased a three six a three twenty six Taylor Baritone. Which strings and which gauge do you recommend?" For that one, I really like the Elixir Baritone strings. Yes, man, <laughs> for an acoustic baritone guitar. That's a great set of strings. I would agree. I am. <laughs> They're so good. All right, my turn. I got this from Steve Bigelow on the email. I have a Taylor 914 CE. How often should I get the neck adjusted? Probably not as often as you might think because typically a truss rod adjustment will want, it'll for a certain setup, a certain set of strings, you'll adjust it into that spot and it'll stay there. If you start noticing that it's got too much relief, which is neck bending forward, if you start noticing that the neck is starting to bend backwards and the strings are buzzing against the fingerboard, that usually indicates that the guitar is going through some climate changes, which are you know, a humid environment, dry environment, hot environment, something like that. And so that's a symptom that you wanna look and make sure that the guitar is actually holding up exactly the way that we want it to. So you might be looking at some humidity mitigation efforts at that point, if you're having to adjust it regularly. So typically you set the guitar up, you adjust the truss rod and you leave it be. Awesome, Sharpie. All right, this one just came in from Tarkus. Is there a best material for picks? Wood, plastic, what do you say? Oh, it depends on the sound you wanna make. There are a bunch of really cool materials. Like Jay had said a few minutes ago, he was using a, a felt pick on a bass guitar. The Tortex material, there's the Thermex material that we're making some picks out of. Man, every single one of those materials based on the density and the wearing characteristics, they all have a different sound. They're all viable options. So I wouldn't say that there is one best material. Just try them all, huh? Yeah, you got to try and see what fits for that guitar, that set of strings, and your playing style. Right on. I just read a new question too that came in that I was. There's some of these in the uh, in the email as well, so we'll 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 address the question on the live feed. TC wrote, "Does the neck need to be humidified? I live in a dry climate and have a sound hole humidifier. Is that enough?" Depends on how dry. Keeping the guitar in the case is the easiest way to keep your guitar in good condition because that case provides a pretty reasonably good environment for the guitar. But yeah, every part of the guitar that's made of wood, it's all going to respond in a similar way. So if you've got a sound hole humidifier, typically that's enough to keep a guitar in good condition if you're keeping it in the case while you're not playing it. In some rare cases where it's extremely dry, Maybe you use a sound hole humidifier plus an additional humidifier up in the near the headstock or something like that. But you'll see uh, the symptoms of a dry guitar. You'll start to see the fret ends getting a little sharp. So when you run your hand down the neck, if you feel them poking your fingers, that can be a symptom. Of course, you'll, you can look at the back and the top of the guitar. You might look and see if the the amount of back bow or forward bow the neck has, if those symptoms are changing, then you might need additional, additional humidifying. Awesome. Who's next? Andy. No, Sharpie. My turn? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, let's see here. How about this one that came through for, from Bob Blades? Uh, he said, do you have an idea of what strings will go on a guitar when you're designing it? If not, how long into the process does it take to determine? Wonderful question. That's a great question. I usually will have a tension profile or a, at least an idea of what kind of strings I'd want to put on that guitar. So if I'm building, let's say, a grand concert guitar 
a grand concert shaped guitar and I know I've just put a cedar top on it, maybe a rose with back and sides. And I know I'm going to play finger style music on it. I'll probably have in my, my head that I'm going to use a light gauge set of strings or something like that. Now, could I tell you exactly what alloy? Eh, probably not. I'm going to experiment to see what it's going to do because all of these designs are going to work within a pretty good range. Now, so you might try a phosphor bronze set. You might try an 80-20 brass set. You might try a nickel bronze set. There's going to be a range where it'll work good. So yeah, I have an idea of what I want to do with it, but it's rarely as specific as something like the GS Mini Bass. That was a case where absolutely this thing is designed to use a certain string composition, a certain string type, because that instrument lives so far outside the boundaries of what a normal guitar is. Yes. Actually, you know what, Jay? I'm going to jump in because he just segued right into a question I have for you. So I'm, I'm going twice. Um, Evan asked uh, in that same in that same front is, have we ever considered creating our own strings specifically for V-class guitars? Oh, I have oh solid question. Um, I've thought about it <laughs> and I, we have not done it. Partially because we don't build strings ourselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, one of the things that's really fun with that design is it becomes super reflective of all the little changes that a player makes. It'll become more reflective of the woods you're building the guitar from, the shape of the guitar, the pick you're using, the strings you do put on it. And it, it exaggerates all of those unique characteristics. There are times I've thought, oh, it would be amazing if I could get exactly the right string wire hardness to match with the hardness of the fret. That's something that I don't think anybody's addressing that I'd love to I'd love to figure out at some point. So you could match those two metals so that they work perfectly with each other. But uh, we'll see. Maybe someday. Right on. Oh. Andy Lund. Uh, question. This is a good one from Kevin Harrison. He has a he has three guitars, GS Mini K, two twenty four, and an eight twelve. It's impossible for me to hit those Beatles notes. So I've been detuning my guitars a full step down. D to D. Okay. Um, now he can hit the notes, but he's, it's too much slack in his guitar. So is it okay to go to medium gauge strings without any adjustment? And also, if he's hitting those notes only by de dropping it down a step, good job, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, I mean, you're getting pretty close. If, if you yeah. can get within a whole step, that's that you're that's doing better than I can. Um, yeah, it's that's totally okay. Because yeah. what you're looking to do at that point is you're trying to equalize the amount of tension that that's that uh, the strings are putting toward the guitar. So if you're if you're drop tuning a full half step, that significantly reduced the amount of tension that you've got on the guitar. I wouldn't hesitate to go a gauge up because that'll bring you right back close to where you started with. Right. So kind of to sum that question up, because that's a very common question, you you can deviate from the factory spec in either direction pretty much without it might just be fine you might need a neck adjustment but it might just sit fine right in most cases yeah many people are afraid to to if it if it comes with 12 gauge strings they they say they don't want to change their tires yeah they, they want to keep the same set of tires on yeah so that's i mean that's true and there's something to be that to be said for that because it will work well but when you're dropping the tension by slacking the strings off a lot, more likely than not, you could use a slightly higher tension string to Pull equalize them. that right. and keep it set up well. Now, if you're comfortable with the looseness and the, the sound of the guitar when you've dropped it, you might just enjoy the easier to play lower tension feel. That's not a bad thing because it makes it super easy on your fingertips to get around on. So that's another option. If you like the sound of the guitar when you drop tune it, you may consider even setting the guitar up to optimize that set of strings at that tuning. Man, guitars are cool. Hey, mom. Oh, they're amazing. Andy built his first guitar when he was eight, mom. I was you trying see, to learn mom. how to play. I was trying to learn how to play Van Halen songs. It's cool. <laughs> it's okay. 
Um, I have well, I was two, trying I, to do that too. <laughs> I know, but like I, I was, you know, playing baseball and you know, you're, you're, you're wonderful, Andy. All right. I got uh, back to back questions. Um, I love to, this is an email question. Tim H sent, I love to play classical Spanish music on my guitar. What is the right Taylor guitar for me? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, we build a couple of nylon string guitars. And I consider them more at this point, they're more of a hybridized guitar. So it's, it's geared for a, uh, like a steel string player who's looking to incorporate some nylon string sounds in their, in their repertoire. That said, the Academy A12 is one of my favorite nylon string guitars. Yeah. I love the way that thing works. So it, good. I mean, it's not an elaborate guitar. It's not a complex guitar, but man, I love the sounds that you can get out of it. So that's one of my favorites currently. Me too. Yeah, that's it's such a wonderful guitar. All right, Michael Morgan wrote, is it best to pick a thinner pick or picks on cedar tops guitars versus thicker picks if you opt not to finger pick? Mm, I don't think that it matters that much because it it has to do, the thickness of the pick has to do with how you want to hold and use the pick. Like I've seen some players who use big, big, giant, heavy, thick pick, and they play with such an unbelievably delicate touch that they get a brilliant sound out of a cedar top guitar. For some players, if they really want to be strumming hard, then you might go with a thinner pick so that you're not, um, the sound doesn't kind of become mushy or oh, so heavily overtoned out that it's just kind of getting distorted and fuzzy sounding. So I wouldn't say that there's a best. I'd say that there's something that's right for the way that you want to hold the pick, but try them all, certainly. Awesome. All right, so we're at an hour and two, Mark. I think we're gonna go one more Sharpie question, one more Andy Lund question, one more Jay question, then into Sharpie's question. And we'll wrap up the show. How does that Great. sound? Crazy. All right. Great. Awesome. That's unbelievable. I love that in the feed right now, everyone's fighting over the idea of winning your sign, Jay. They so want the sign right this now. Is, this is good. I think, that, <laughs> I think we'll find a way. We will find a way to get a, do a sign giveaway. We're going to do some giveaways in the next coming week, including. You know, I think I might, have, I might have one of those in the closet next to my shop. This is, it, we, we'll get some of the- In other, Andy's sign? Whoa. This is a special LED version, so it doesn't backlight. Uh, <laughs> but we have a couple and we'll find a way to do some giveaways. That's a really good idea. Also, maybe yeah. some Taylor merch. That would be fun. Maybe yeah, a, sign, a signed I mean, issue of Bob's book. I'll, maybe I'll your, donate my pencil or something. <laughs> I was going to say one of your pencils or a sketchbook. Okay. All right. So Sharpie, question. All right. My, my last question that came through- um, not slipping off strings. We're talking about some of us have sweatier hands when we're playing. What is the best non-slip pick to have? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. So non-slip pick. I've seen a lot of people put a little bit of sticky back sandpaper on a pick. Um, in case you want to know what that's like. So this is really common. Roll a sandpaper like this. You could tear off a little tiny bit stick it on your pick and now you have a non-stick or non-slip pick that works really good what grit some you pick andy is like 220 or uh, what we, what uh that one's 150 you could use 120 depends on how grippy you want i guess 220, some picks 21 whatever it takes some picks will have like a raised logo as a non-slip so those work really well i've seen uh people drill tiny holes through a pick mm -hmm. so that it's more of like a gentle embossed kind of thing. A lot of picks do have some sort of grip there. And so you might want to look into a couple of those options. When the 814 was revoiced five years ago, special H, uh, HD light elixir strings were designed for it. Now the lights are recommended instead. What changed or more importantly, what difference in sound should I expect? Okay, when we designed the 814 or redesigned it, I was specifically looking to get a little more, a little higher tension on the top end. And so that was a kind of the graduated, what people call a reverse bluegrass or what we call the HD lights. 
was graduated so that you would get a little bolder, more top feeling high end response. Some people loved them. Some players did not like them. So the light gauge set worked pretty good for a pretty broad range of player. And you could go back and forth between them, usually without having to do any additional setup work on the guitar. So we kind of settled in on the light gauge because it seemed to fit, it seemed to be a better middle ground for most players. Since then, with the, the adoption of the V-class bracing, that guitar is working in such a vastly different way than the way it used to. We tend to like the light gauge string a little better for most playing styles, but certainly the HD light is still one of my favorite sets and it works really well for a lot of guitars. So that's, again, it's one of those choices that's very unique to the player and the way that they want to use their guitar. Awesome. All right, I got a good one. I got a good one. I love these kind of questions. Ready for this one? Karen wrote in via email, just purchased a Taylor K26 and wonder what are the best strings for Koa Wood guitars? Ah, now with a hardwood top guitar like that, man, you could do almost anything you want because that guitar, if it's one of the brand new ones with the cutaway sound port design, that's a shorter scale length than it used to be. We're setting it up with a light gauge set of strings. You could try the nickel bronze set from Dadari. You could try the uncoated phosphor bronze. You could try the elixirs that it would have had on it when we set it up. You could try almost anything and they'll all work super well. The one thing that's most important with that guitar is that you play it a lot. And what you'll notice right from the get go, the first week, the first two weeks, the first month, that guitar is going to get riper and riper and riper like a peach that's ripening on your tree. They'll get sweeter and smoother and more responsive as it breaks in over that first month. So every set of strings that you're gonna try, if you change them after a week of playing, after two weeks, you'll think that every set is your new favorite because really what you're hearing is this thing come even more alive every time you change the, set, the strings. So I'd say try a bunch of different flavors and see what you like best. That is awesome. All right, it's time. It's that time. You ready, Andy? It's that time of the show we call Sharpie's Question. It might take him a couple of hours. It could take him all day to think of a question for powers. What will that Sharpie say? Here comes Sharpie's question. Oh, I love Beautiful. the dominant sharp nine to flat nine sound. That was a yes. solid dominant chord. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right, Andy, I have options for you. Um, okay. Do you want a question guitar re related or a life question? Surprise me. They're All right, let's see life question. Right now, this book right here is my Bible. It's called Tribe of Mentors. Okay. In that, there's a bunch of uh, life advice from, from the best in the world, it says. And there's a question that gets asked throughout the book. And if you were given a billboard to put whatever you wanted on it, what would it say? Ha-ha. <laughs> We stumped the guests. A billboard. Oh, no, I'm not stumped. There's just so many possibilities. <laughs> if it was on a billboard next to a freeway, I'd say keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look here. I like it. That's awesome. Uh, get, get where you're going safely, please. <laughs> right on. All right. All right. All right. So Andy, uh, I know you're not a sports guy and I always like to turn this show into a sports show. I can dig sports. I just can't. Well, see you know what? You, you, you dig a really cool sport. And if, if, if you guys don't know this, Andy is a surfer and I commend him because I've been watching my wife learn how to surf and trying to learn how to surf and it's hard. So good job. But I did wear this San Diego Padres hat for Mr. Powers because he was born and raised in this area. 
Uh, I am really glad that they are in brown uniforms again. So that's all I have to turn this into a sports show. Yep. Um, next week, join us next week. Oh, you got another question. What's going on? No, no, I, I have to say it because I've said it. How many, what week is this? 12 weeks in? Yeah, 12 weeks. We did 12 things. Hey, everybody, you can get a left-handed guitar at no extra charge. Any Taylor model, we got you. Ah, uh, there he goes. Andy, he's turning <laughs> left-handed again. See, there was there was a, a note that came in from email who's who's a fan of ours. First of all, thank you for watching. And hey. he says that he just watched the episode with Terry Myers, Andy J, and Sparky, the left Sparky. hander. Sparky yeah. the left hander. And he says that he used to pitch left handed. So there was the baseball opening in the email, Jay. You're 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 doing something. There is something in that direction. They've been oh, man. Arguing. Uh, Gabe sent a question about uh, about I, the ta uh, D Detroit Tigers again. I mean, stop! You, they're not. I don't, think, get it. I don't think people realize how many baseball players are into playing guitar, mm. oh, and I do at a really, really <laughs> high level. Yeah, like, I, it's kind of an embarrassing story, but I've got this this uh, friend who is um, he's retired now. He was a professional baseball player. And I had actually met him at a NAMM trade show because I heard this guy playing and went, dang, that guy is good. It's like, okay. man, what a cool, what a cool player. And so we, we kind of hit it off and then come to find out, oh, this guy was a really good baseball player. That was like actually a, like a thing for him. But yeah, it's, it's pretty common for a lot of folks who, are, who have that kind of dexterity and that ability with their hands and their fingertips to be into into things like guitar playing and baseball. So I get it. He's talking about Bernie Williams. He's talking about Bernie Williams, New York. We, we had one more he, sports question that came through for Andy player. Powers. <laughs> yeah. question. Yes, Andy Powers. We, we have one sports question for you, Andy. Um, uh -oh. This comes from Sean. I think he's one of the local guys here in town with us. What's your favorite break in San Diego County? What swell direction? Ooh, I don't know, Sean. Do you know what swell you want? <laughs> How about in general? Where do you just love paddling out? Um, winter time. Uh, winter time. I'm a black sky. Yeah. I I went to US, UCSD. One of the big draws there, aside from the, some incredible musicians there, was uh, my love for surfing blacks. I grew up surfing beach breaks. It's a thing. I live up in North County. Grew up in North County, so a lot of times. I'm kind of at one of the local reef breaks or beach breaks around kind of Oceanside, Carlsbad, Encinitas area. Oh, he just so. hit me with uh, West. Oh, straight <laughs> West. Well, all the options are good. <laughs> straight right West. On. Well, anything goes. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know what you guys are talking about, but I'm going to take a nod for that. I'll good job, you. guys. What I'll a wonderful get, I'll get a show. Map out. What yeah. a wonderful show. Thank you, Andy Powers, for hanging out with us. It is always inspiring and uh, to, to soak up the knowledge like a sponge. Um, next week, you know what? We'll find a way to get, <laughs> give away a sign next week. So Sick. join us. And, and you know what we're going to need to do um, for everybody who was here before um, with the Bob one last week? Andy, we're going to need to get you back for just a straight rapid fire or or a trot fire slow slow run fire whatever you want to call it um <laughs> one of these episodes get you back here yeah. and just answer questions because they keep coming through and, and we love I'd, having you on i'd here. be happy to i'd be happy to do that anytime so uh, next week's episode is going to be so good we've got lindsay love from our repair department coming in and we we're going to talk about guitar triage. One of the things we're going to talk about is first caring about caring for your investment. But a good point here is what to do if something just terrible happens to your guitar, like a crack, what not to do. So on, we're going to talk with her next week. We'll have some giveaways and maybe some trivia and some more Q and a thank you for joining us. You guys have been fantastic. As always, we appreciate you. We appreciate you, Andy Powers, Andy Lund, Sharpie. Andy Lund, take it away, my friend. He talked sticky fingers. We talked about tires. We listened to Andy. He's not so rapid fire. Today, we nerded out all about strings. And all of these things 
are our favorite things on Tuesdays, Tuesdays on prime time, prime time. What the heck was it? What was that? Well, it was prime time. Thank you all for listening, everybody. Thank you, Andy. We'll see you all next week. Take care, folks.